Yeah, good morning, everyone. Um, my name is um, Thomas Reidemeister. Welcome to the webinar about bringing Bluetooth low energy to RT Threat. Um, today's talk is a result of an RT Threat uh, programming contest. RT Threat is fairly engaged in hosting uh, programming contests. I was invited by the RT Threat community to give a talk about uh, my experience during the process. Um, part of that uh, contest submission was uh, to basically bring Bluetooth low energy um, to a chip that was newly added to the RT Threat ecosystem. So this talk is about my experience basically getting used to RT Threat and basically how you can actually port a bare metal Bluetooth low energy stack uh, into RT Threat and how easy it is to use RT Threat. Let's get started. Um, my background, I'm the uh, CTO of LabForge Incorporated. We're based in uh, Waterloo, Ontario. For the past 10 years, we've been designing cameras for industrial defense and robotic use. Our specialty is edge computing. Um, the cameras do standalone AI processing and our customers basically include uh, automotive, government um, and transportation companies. On the right, you basically see our, our flagship camera. Uh, this is currently being sold on uh, Mauser. That's the LabForge bottlenose. And uh, professionally, we work uh, closely together with uh, Shiva, Cadence, Biora, TDK on the design of that camera. And the main platform is actually a Toshiba rate, still rated SOC. Uh, we're a fairly uh, small team. Um, so if you ever need a, a custom camera design, uh, we're the right people to talk to. Um, the engagement that started with RT Threat was more on a personal level. Um, I'm a very active martial arts enthusiast, and I've been looking for a platform uh, that can be used uh, to improve reaction training. Um, so in my spare time, I basically started using RT Threat, and we're eventually planning to also adopt uh, RT Threat professionally um, in our portfolio. My talk is the webinar structured into the following sections. First, I'll start with a brief introduction into RT Threat, and then I'll basically dive further into the platform uh, used for the contest, uh, which was the Nanjing Kingheng CH32B208W uh, platform. Then I'll basically discuss the design of the BLE stack that is used for that platform, uh, what samples are basically provided uh, for bare metal, and then describe basically by platform that basically was the program and contest entry that actually used the BLE stack in order to uh, fulfill its function. And then we'll open up for discussion. And um, everything for that uh, demo is open source. So I'll also basically provide references to the source code and the uh, PCB design at the end as well. So let's basically start with RT Threat. RT Threat has been around since 2006. Uh, it basically started as a, a small operating system with IP support. Over the past, uh, you know, more than a decade has grown into three flavors. Um, you can basically configure RT Threat to be available as Nano IoT OS, or basically smart variant. Um, the Nano variant is uh, hard real time. It's an extremely compact kernel, and you can basically configure it to fit into, let's say, three kilobytes of flash and about uh, 1.5 kilobytes of RAM. It provides uh, threading support. Uh, you have time management, interrupt management, and uh, uh, basic interprocess. Synchronization, it's a very compact schedule that also results in relatively short interrupt latency. Um, the standard is almost like a fully featured POSIX operating system, except that you don't have a separate uh, process address space that makes it also suitable for uh, compact microcontrollers. And it's a fairly rich ecosystem that is highly um, customizable that I use for my contest submission. So I'm going to talk about this in uh, detail in a second. And then the last flavor you can configure RT Thread to is RT Thread Smart, which is about 500 kilobytes in size. Uh, that adds um, MMU support, has a micro kernel, and there you actually get uh, separate address spaces basically for the processes um, itself. Let's talk, uh, take a closer look at the um, RT Thread IoT OS. Um, it's a highly customizable uh, kernel. Uh, the features can be enabled and disabled, uh, similar to how you configure a, a Linux kernel. Um, it has, um, you know, console configuration support, similar to make menu config uh, that you basically have for Linux kernels. Um, there's also rich IDE support uh, using RT Thread Studio that you can use uh, to quickly get started on uh, development. Um, for my project, I decided to use the uh, command line, um, and I basically used the uh, C line IDE instead of RT Thread. 
uh, for my uh, submission. The uh, configuration options don't only extend to the kernel itself, but also cover um, you know, additional features uh, that extend it to the application layers. You'll see it's overall a fairly rich ecosystem. You have MDNS support, uh, database support, virus scripting engines, MDNS, and uh, best of all, you also have a POSIX like API. So if you transition, let's say, from a, a different real-time operating system and you already have existing POSIX experience, for example, QNX, and Lenox, basically adapting to this API is also uh, fairly straightforward, and you can basically realize your implementation uh, fairly quickly. Like in my case, the uh, contest submission, I basically uh, hammered it out in a period of a few hours that so was basically spread over um, three weekends. Mm -hmm. uh, the other feature uh, that you have is um, the builds are unified, so you basically build your application as well as the uh, kernel itself uh, in one build. Um, so all the compiler optimizations um, that you basically use for application also extended to the kernel and uh, vice versa. Uh, you can experiment with, for example, uh, link time optimization to reduce the size of the kernel uh, for your platform even uh, down further. And um, depending on your configuration, you can run it on uh, a lot of microcontrollers and um, there's uh, existing platform support for ARM, MIPS, Extensa, RISC-5, um, and other platforms as well. So in the past, I've used a virus project that used uh, Linux and embedded platforms uh, like um, Hitachi uh, SH, or for example, STM32s. Uh, so if you want to bring in a Linux kernel over there in order to have similar rich uh, ecosystem, you usually would have to implement, let's say, a separate SRAM chip and then most of the resources on your microcontroller would already be eaten away by basically just bringing U-Boot onto that platform. Um, as opposed to that, with RT Thread, you can really configure everything down so it fits into even the smallest microcontroller. Um, let's take a closer look at the uh, Bluetooth Low Energy support. Um, RT Thread already comes with existing BLE support, mostly for uh, Nordic SOCs and uh, Nordic transceivers. Um, the contest uh, did use a RISC-V platform that had a BLE-5 that wasn't, exist wasn't currently supported by RT Thread. Uh, so I decided to uh, port the BLE stack from the vendor that was made for bare metal over um, to that platform. Um, I also wanted to explore RT Thread and Risk Five deeper, um, so that's uh, how this project basically came about. Um, the other um, issues you might see with Nordic is um, it's a fairly costly platform compared to uh, the WCH platforms. Um, I looked up on DigiKey, so basically the comparable Nordic chip uh, would basically sell at multiples of what um, the WCH chip basically uh, sells for. And if you use external transceivers, uh, for example, the NRF24 uh, uh, platform, that also basically increases the bottom lines of your design. So it would be preferable to basically uh, have an SOC that basically comes with uh, BLE support uh, from the start. So let's take a closer look at the uh, uh, platform that um, I chose for the contest, which is the Nanjing Kinheng Microelectronics uh, CH32 V2AW platform. Um, it's a fairly rich platform uh, considering the price. Um, it has all the standard microcontroller features, um, timers, uh, I2C, UART, SPI, again, um, even a 12-bit ADC. And then best of all, it also comes with uh, you know, two USB uh, uh, endpoints, and you can also basically uh, use Ethernet on that chip. It actually has a, a built-in PHY, uh, so you basically don't have to worry about external PHYs in order to get Ethernet connectivity that keeps the bomb lines for the design uh, fairly close as well, as you basically see in the dev board um, shown in the slide. Um, the core itself is a RISC-V uh, that runs at 144 MHz, uh, which is a fairly attractive platform for all sorts of devices. So you can use it, for example, as a general workhorse uh, for a lot of control applications or even uh, mobile devices, BLE connectivity, or for example, to bridge uh, certain interfaces uh, from BLE to anything, USB or BLE to CAN. And the vendor also provides several bare metal examples for that. And I was also surprised by the uh, price. So if you look at the uh, you know single unit or even uh, low volume pricing on LCSC, uh, the pricing basically for the chip uh, comes down to roughly a dollar. So if you have a dollar chip, you get a POSIX-like operating system. Uh, that's a fairly decent development platform in order to get started. 
uh, for um, such a project. Let's take a closer look at the uh, BLE stack uh, that is provided by uh, WCH. It is provided as a binary static library. It has a host and a controller interface uh, similar to what you expect uh, from a competing solution. Um, the configuration of your device can be for, performed via uh, the general access protocol or the general attribute protocol. Uh, the chip itself is a five, five for 2.4 gigahertz uh, with a Gaussian frequency key shift ring. Um, the stack can be configured by adjusting header files that basically ship with the uh, static library. And anyone who has used BLE before, let's say in different platforms, would tell you that um, such a stack is usually fairly stateful. So in many cases, you would need like an operating system itself or at least some state machine in order to basically uh, manage the connectivity uh, and the hardware interaction. Um, so the sample that is basically provided by the vendor actually uses their own scheduler, which uh, is uh, Timos. And I'm going to dive into uh, detail in a sec, basically how this could be ported over to RT Thread. Uh, the vendor further provides samples uh, for uh, different BLE applications. What I used for my project was the uh, BLE UART bridge. Uh, you'll also find uh, bare metal samples for uh, HID devices, keyboard, mouses, touch centers, um, heart rate sensors. Uh, there are further examples for um, BLE mesh, a BLE Ethernet bridge, and also there are samples basically how you can use BLE in order to do in-system firmware updates as well. Uh, from a 10,000 foot view, the uh, UART sample uh, that is provided by the vendor uh, configures the device as server. Um, the device exposes several characteristics uh, that are being used uh, to transmit and receive data. Uh, one is the device characteristic that basically enumerates the device and basically provides hardware profile and identifiers of what the device is. And then there's another characteristic that is the transmit uh, characteristics, that's the transmission from the device um, to the client itself, and then the receive characteristic, which is basically the, the transmission channel, basically uh, from a remote device, basically to the device itself. Um, what I did for my project was to basically replace the hardware UART endpoint basically with RT thread endpoints uh, in order to basically use it as command channel between an Android application and the um, end device. So as I mentioned before, the uh, vendor uses TMOS in order to do the um, state management of the BLE connection and also the state management uh, of uh, the request and reply uh, uh, interaction between the device uh, and the other and the endpoint. Um, this looked fairly challenging at the outset, uh, but it was actually fairly easy to port over to RT thread. Um, the port was done in three straps. Uh, the first step was to basically configure the bare metal uh, BLE stack from the vendor into the configuration that I needed for my device. Then the second step was to basically instrument the interrupt service routines, basically use them um, inside RT thread uh, in order to basically move uh, bare metal interrupt service routines into RT thread. You basically need to add a preamble uh, and a follow up uh, to the interrupt service routine. The preamble uh, basically saves the current uh, thread state and invokes the scheduler, and then the suffix basically looks at the scheduler, basically which thread to schedule uh, next. Uh, so it's fairly easy to basically adapt the metal code um, to uh, RT thread, uh, especially if you have to have drivers that basically rely heavily on the service routines. Then the next challenge was to basically unentangle the tight main loop uh, from the sample, which was basically invoking the um, Timo scheduler. Um, in a tight loop and then basically doing the follow-up processing uh, for the UART itself. And um, I wanted to isolate this basically from my demo application and this could be uh, fairly nicely done in RT thread by basically moving all that basically in a separate stack, a separate thread. Um, so I basically as, as you see over here, everything fits into a few lines um, of a, a thread routine. So I'm basically doing the uh, buffer initialization, the library initialization, um, the uh, hardware abstraction layer that is related to uh, the BLE peripheral, uh, the access profile, and also other peripherals that are basically related to BLE uh, at the beginning of the thread. And then the thread main loop basically just uh, involves the TMOS scheduler uh, from the vendor library, and then basically uh, does my command processing uh, shortly after based on what's received over there. And then even though RT thread uh, uh, basically is a preemptive uh, 
operating system uh, in order to basically conserve cycles. I'm basically giving up the processor so I can explicitly call the scheduler over here and I basically schedule other routines in um, in my uh, project. So let's take a close look at the uh, demo platform itself. Um, so the submission itself was a reaction training device uh, that you can use uh, for uh, martial arts training or polymeric training or in other uh, sports training um, environments. Um, the device itself uh, is a battery operated uh, device um, that has um, an accelerometer, LEDs, um, and um, it's operated remotely via Bluetooth Low Energy. Uh, so you can configure it uh, to light up external stimuli. So for example, light up the LED and then someone has to react to it. And then the accelerometer basically measures uh, if basically an impact uh, was detected in order to measure the general right arm basically of the uh, reaction. Uh, if you basically have multiple of those, um, so basically as part of the demo, I did a production run with a JLPCB of uh, five units. Uh, you can basically lay them out, let's say in your uh, gym in a pattern and then um, uh, do uh, round training or, for example, in a martial arts context, you can basically mount those devices uh, to a training dummy or a heavy bag in order to basically train different uh, compost itself. And I've used them in my uh, local club and uh, with the support of the University Karate and Jiu-Jitsu Club, uh, we also basically did a few training sessions um, as part of the uh, demonstration. And then um, since you don't want to have uh, wires hanging off your heavy bag, obviously wires in your gym, basically all the uh, commands are basically triggered externally from an Android app. Um, so basically VOE was the best transport channel in order to use it. So let's dive in deeper into the hardware design basically of the uh, demo platform. Um, so the uh, core itself is the microcontroller that was outlined before. Uh, the external stimuli are provided by uh, two uh, high-power RGB LEDs. Um, the chip itself doesn't have enough drive strength in order to basically uh, drive those LEDs directly. So I'm using a 74573 buffer in order to drive those chips. The uh, uh, power source uh, for the demo is a lithium polymer battery. Uh, I'm using a microchip uh, charging IC uh, and the battery is primarily charged basically uh, through that USB connector. And then the battery voltage or the external applied voltage basically dropped out with an LEO to 3.3 uh, volts. And then everything except for the LEDs basically is running on 3.3 volts uh, for the SOC. The um, accelerometer basically measures uh, the reaction time. And that's still part of uh, active uh, development. Um, so fixed thresholds didn't seem to work that well depending on the surface, how you mount it. Uh, so different heavy bags basically would need different uh, thresholds over there. So I'm still working on basically bringing them out on the Android application to basically configure those thresholds uh, dynamically. Um, the other nice feature about this platform is that um, the chip has a, a USB bootstrap loader. Um, so if you want to use it for factory programming, you can just use the USB and all to basically deploy the initial firmware on the chip itself. Um, the uh, wireless front end is basically realized uh, through an inverted F antenna over here. Um, since this project was realized in a, a fairly short time, uh, I didn't spend much time to uh, calibrate the layout myself. Um, so I basically used the matching network that was basically provided as a sample and tried to imitate the uh, uh, stack up of the development board and that worked out fairly well. Um, the other feature that this chip has is it actually has internal calibration register where you can tweak um, the calibration of the antenna a little bit, uh, just in case, for example, your hardware design is off a little bit. Um, for full production, I would potentially uh, put a port over here so you can use like a vector network analyzer and also basically uh, properly calibrate uh, the antenna. But for the demo purposes, I was quite happy basically with the outcome of that uh, design. Um, all those elements were in stock in uh, LCSC. Um, so the entire board, except for the uh, connectors, was basically turnkey manufactured by uh, JLPCB. So you can basically uh, take the design from my website and basically manufacture it itself if you basically want to experiment with that platform further. So let's have a closer look at the uh, software stack that is being used uh, for the demo itself. Um, so most of the uh, software is made up of the RT thread uh, 5.01 kernel. Um, the uh, board support package by RT thread was provided for the uh, 32V2AW. 
uh, what was missing was basically the BLE library inside the uh, board support package. And I explained before how I integrated that library. And I basically made heavy use of the um, debugging uh, capabilities inside RT Thread. And one of the most notable features for anyone who gets started with RT Thread or basically wants to use RT Thread in order to uh, bring up a new plan is really the uh, capabilities of the Finnish console. So inside your application, you can fairly easily extend um, the uh, console. So you can basically place hooks um, inside the console and then use the uh, interactive command prompt to uh, test, for example, certain hardware features. So what I did for uh, my design was I basically uh, instrumented uh, this buffer. I instrumented uh, the battery voltage, um, the status pins basically of my charging IC, and also the um, accelerometer. Uh, so I could basically interactively talk about, you know, this is my battery charging, you know, what's my uh, battery charge voltage, uh, or basically did I configure uh, the pins correctly uh, for my buffer itself? And this could all be done interactively. So if you basically do an initial flash um, to the board and use the console to test those features, uh, you might actually preserve, uh, for example, flash endurance. Uh, some platforms only have like limited uh, flash cycles, so write endurance, basically doing prototyping can become an issue, whereas if you use RT thread, um, you know, give it a best go, instrument everything, and then you can test interactively instead of basically rewriting a piece of firmware, uh, testing one component, moving um, to the next one. Uh, so you can basically test multiple things basically in one go. So that makes it actually fairly interesting to use the Finnish console as well. So yeah, let's have a close look, basically what it looks in practice. Um, so this is a video that was uh, recorded uh, in the University of Waterloo uh, Martial Arts Club, uh, where several people basically tried out the platform in order to do reaction training on a heavy bag. Um, I had a few uh, battery failures during the demo, so eventually the demo was only recorded during one. Um, so we don't see uh, full combos, uh, but it basically gives you an idea of basically what's capable uh, with that platform. And then the external stimuli were basically configured during the Android app. Anyone else wants to have a go at it? Or? Yeah. 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 yeah, sure, go for it. Very fun reaction. Or you could do the same thing but with kicks. Maybe really? like the whole F1 setup where they have like yeah. the rows. Uh, okay. That bottom one was meant for kicks, but it Sorry, seems to be kind of fun. Well, it'd be cool if you could like, go for it. if you had smaller lights, you could put them on top of like the dash and then move them around. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, so that's pretty much uh, it for the presentation. Um, you know, we can open up for discussion um, as a quick recap. Uh, I was quite surprised basically by the rich uh, feature set that was provided uh, by RT Thread. Um, so you have lots of existing packages to uh, integrate high level features. Uh, it has a fairly low footprint and you know it can be easily customized to even fit the tiniest microcontroller. Um, the POSIX API, like API is fairly nice if you're basically coming from a, a different operating system and you quickly want to get started. Um, it has a large developer community and then if you have a feature uh, that you don't see integrated, they're also happy to uh, you know engage in community support. So there are several uh, con open source contributors as well that basically improve the RT Thread ecosystem. Uh, I was also positively surprised by the uh, RISC V uh, platform, the CH32V208W. Uh, so it's quite a powerhouse, basically, uh, giving the pricing. And the low cost BLE uh, stack basically also makes it uh, fairly attractive to, let's say, other commercial solutions. And um, also, you can run it basically off a single 3.3 volt uh, voltage rail. Uh, you don't need many external components in order to basically do a custom design basically for that particular chip as well. So that's it for my presentation. Uh, let me open up to questions.
Okay, sorry, I was, <laughs> I was on mute. Okay, uh, yeah, let me start it from the from the top again. So, uh, is the uh, traffic connection secure? So it's basically as secure as the uh, BLE standard is. Um, unfortunately, the uh, library that's provided by the vendor is a uh, static library, so I can not really uh, look into the source code. Um, you know, if you want to have a very secure connection, you can basically implement more security at the uh, application layer. Um, so if you want to dive into the security features of that uh, BLE stack, I'm, I, I would basically confer basically to the vendor documentation itself. Um, so if you go to their uh, GitHub for that particular chip, uh, you'll basically find an application node that explains basically all the features that you get with their BLE uh, network stack. Then the other question I'm seeing here is if the uh, BLE is controlled via UART. Um, in that particular case, the BLE is not controlled via UART. Uh, the BLE phi is actually built into the chip itself. Um, so you're basically talking to BLE um, as if it's basically built in a uh, peripheral of the chip itself. Okay, let me see what else. Um, Yes, so the uh, source code as well as the schematic is available on GitHub. Um, so after that talk, I think we can, can provide references to that GitHub. Um, I did the schematic design in uh, KiCad, uh, and you also have all the bombs bomb configured, so you can actually directly uh, build it as the key solution from JPCB if you want to. Okay, so um, taking a closer look at the um, antenna design itself, um, the dev board uh, provides uh, sources in, uh, there are basically Altium sources for the dev board uh, that have an inverted F antenna design. Um, and they also uh, provide a sample uh, matching network for the um, stack up of the development board. Uh, and that's basically a, a dual layer uh, board, um, so you can easily imitate the stacker. And in most cases, basically the sample matching network, if you basically uh, add sufficient loud ground bands, might be good enough for hobby applications. Um, if you want to do uh, your own antenna design, then I would suggest uh, to basically uh, put a connector on there, so you can basically connect a vector network analyzer and basically configure your antenna layout. Um, there are application nodes basically provided by the vendor. Uh, they basically explain uh, how you should basically design the antenna uh, and basically what the ground plane considerations are. Um, okay, the other question is, um, can we set up a Bluetooth connection between the host and the client to get data uh, from a UART? Uh, yes. And that's actually uh, the sample that is provided by the vendor. Um, so if you use their BLE UART example, the device itself basically acts as a bridge uh, between the uh, BLE phi and basically your peripheral. How many BLE devices can be connected uh, um, to a host? Um, in, in my application, the device acted as endpoint. Uh, so I'm basically limited to how many devices I can connect uh, to an Android phone. I tested with up to five devices. Um, if you configure the vendor BLE stack uh, as scanner, um, I would confer basically to the vendor documentation on how many uh, endpoints they could basically um, support, basically the device basically runs as host. I'm connecting to five devices uh, via an Android application. So I have a sample Android application 
um, that basically scans for uh, available devices. And I'm basically using the device name um, to basically find my devices inside the Bluetooth spectrum. And then every device um, that I basically find is automatically paired. And it's limited to five devices uh, since I basically only build five prototypes. Okay, so is it possible to uh, implement a wireless sensor network using the uh, CH32 V28 with its Bluetooth capabilities? Um, that I would say depends on the um, sensor network stack uh, that you're choosing. Unfortunately, the uh, library for Bluetooth or energy that the vendor provides is a static library uh, that doesn't really uh, outline much basically what the internal workings of the uh, 2.4 gigahertz Phi are. Uh, if you can basically deploy a wireless sensor network on top of VLE mesh, um, then I think there's a possibility to do it. Um, so if you go to uh, WCH's GitHub uh, for the VLE, they have a sample basically how to set up that particular chap uh, in a VLE mesh configuration. Based on my experience, it's possible to use a solar panel plus capacity to power the chip and have a stable Bluetooth uh, communication. Um, I think that really depends on how you size um, the solar panel and basically what the backup considerations are uh, for the uh, capacitor. Uh, the basically running the chip at full steam uh, basically was only, let's say, you know, a few tens of uh, milli milliamps. Um, so you can definitely accommodate that based on the capacitor size and basically a solar panel. Um, I would basically have a look at the data sheet um, and also based on your needs for other peripherals as well. Uh, they basically provide power figures, uh, what the chip basically consumes uh, under different configurations. And then also for the uh, Bluetooth communication itself, uh, you can basically schedule in uh, low power modes uh, so that basically the duty cycle of when you have high power needs are also basically spread out over the spectrum so that you can uh, basically conserve energy in order to basically make your uh, uh, basically make your power budget work. Oh, pocket size one. Yeah, I mean, um, I would have a look basically what the wattage is and basically what the output voltage is. And then also basically how you um, take the output voltages and how much losses you basically have in your power tree. You know, so if you uh, use a DC DC converter, you might be efficient to um, capture your uh, output power from the solar panel. But unfortunately, for DC DC converters, the quietest in current basically means that if the microcontroller is off, you would be wasting energy. Um, if you use a LDO. Uh, depending on the output voltage of your uh, solar panel, uh, you might basically waste a lot of energy, basically if your uh, solar panel is running in um, uh, basically at a higher voltage and you basically drop it out um, to basically power the microcontroller. Okay, uh, let's see if there are any, any guidelines, starting tips to start with uh, BLE prototypes. Um, yeah, I would say the best quick start is to basically um, get the development board for that chip and then start with the uh, BLE samples uh, from the vendor. Uh, you can also adapt the firmware that I use for my project to the development board itself. If you basically don't use the um, LED output that I'm using, or basically the uh, charge controller. Um, so that BLE stack should also basically run on the development kit as well.
Okay. Um, if there are no further questions, then I would hand it back to um, Cassie, obviously, to close out the uh, webinar. Uh, thank you very much.